Okay, good afternoon. Oh, you guys know how to do this? Enthusiasm is going to be your secret weapon. So let's start again. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. That's better. That's better. I know most everyone. I know Miss England, so welcome. I know Mr. Rush or Miss Dehone. Yes. Dehone. Okay. Okay. So you guys, Miss Heschner, is this? How are you? Good. Let's see. So let's start today. With this. One of the reasons you're here, maybe the main reason, is to make sure that from this point forward, you are never afraid. There is no fear whatsoever when you're asked to speak. As a matter of fact, you're so confident that you can't wait to get up in front because you're one of the best. Why is this important? Because when you in, in this next semester, maybe two semesters for, for those of you that aren't graduating in May, you're going to walk across the stage and when you, to shake hands with President Ragsdale, when you shake hands with him, you're going to have this big you know what eating grin on your face because you've gotten the job that you want. Because the goal here is not just to get a job. The goal is to get the one that you want. So what I'm going to ask each one of you to commit to do is what Jim Singleton emblazoned on my brain years ago, and that is your next presentation is the best one you've ever delivered. Mr. Carr? Ms. Heath? The next presentation you give will be the best one you've ever delivered. And if you take that to heart in this class, at the end of the class you'll have a competitive advantage. You'll be able to deliver presentations because your brain is synced with your mouth and you can deliver them with all the physical properties and all the confidence that will enable you to be, to, to have a secret weapon to be really effective. Any questions? A couple reviews. One, what's important in this class is that you make sure you're on time. <laughs> oh, Sorry. Mr. Miller! Sorry. See, so why don't you, you're sitting all the way at the back. Come over here and sit over with Miss Heath. So it sounds like you're kind of part of us. So what Mr. Singleton taught me a long time ago, you know, I apply consistently, and you will, is the camera is always on. This course is about learning to project an image of success, the image that you decide that you want to project. Why? Because from this point forward, whether you know it, whether you understand it or not, right now, Mr. Kreider, you are projecting an image. Is that the one you want to project? So in this course, we're going to work on it. You're going to be, you're going to present, you're going to be videotaped at the end of the course. If this is true, to the other 425 courses, you're going to be really good. You're going to have lots of confidence. You can step up anytime you want to and deliver great presentations in a group like this and presentations one on one in our classroom. Now, over how many of you have read The Fifth Agreement? Oh, good. I haven't read it yet. Well, this is a book that I read, I think, last summer. And I've been reading these self-help books all my life. I think this is the third, until I finally got it. That you could really improve your life if you just learn how to do it. And the book is called The Fifth Agreement. It's on your extra credit list. We're going to talk about the syllabus in a couple of minutes, but let's let's start our course with the the essential elements of the principles in the fifth agreement. And the fifth agreement is about this uh, 
at no fooling, this ancient Toltec civilization that existed in Mexico. And before the English got here, as a matter of fact, when the Spanish got here, they brought smallpox and it killed off the Toltecs and it killed off the Mayans and some other ones because they couldn't combat those diseases. But recently, or Don, or, or Miguel Ruiz translated the old Toltec religion, religion uh, uh, language and came up, came, came up with the, the four principles that the Toltecs had used to be successful. And if you take these principles, you just port them to here and to every other society. But they're so simple that I want to start with them in this course. Okay? Number one, if you're going to be successful. Always, the Toltec said, always be impeccable with your word. Which card, what's that name? Speak fluidly. Fluidly, there's more to it. Impeccable. I am. I am. P-E-C-C-A-B-L-E. Impeccable it means always tell the truth. Never dodge the truth. But the Toltecs, they were a society of, of truth seekers. So the reason that you, that ultimately, why did George Washington say honesty is the best policy? It's not for some moralistic reason, it's because it works. That if you commit yourself to always keeping your word impeccable, it means you always conscious of, of telling the truth as you know it, then you never lead another person astray. So, so number one. Number two, make sure I can keep them in order. Yeah. High eyes. We're going to go over disc and values in the next couple sessions, for those of you that haven't taken my profile or, or discussed it. Second rule is never take anyone else what, they, what anyone else says, personally. Each one of you is unique. There's never been another person like you, or like you, that's been ever created on the face of the earth. I mean, cellular structure, how you have run your life, there's no one that, that is like you, there will never be another person like you. So imagine when someone says something to you that you take personally, then essentially you're saying that they know enough about you to direct you. Not even your mother. So if we take what someone else says personally, we go off the truth scale and we take that as if it were, as if it is meaningful in our lives. I'm not saying you shouldn't get feedback. But don't take what others say personally. Let it go right off your back. You can say to yourself, you don't know me. You can't possibly know me. Don't take what other people say personally. Third, this word that we've all had <laughs> defined. Assume. As a matter of fact, Ms. Gambrell even defined it for us, I think, last semester. You know this magic word, you make a mm <clears throat> out of me? That's what assume means? The Toltec said, never assume. Why? If you're a truth seeker and you assume without knowing, what happens? Mr. Marlin? So, uh, you know. I think you've got a little distraction. No, I got your syllabus for the bus. Cool. Okay. Yeah. So, never assume. Why? If you're a truth seeker, why is that a problem? I guess because you can take it the wrong way. Sure. You assume without knowing. The critical issue is to know and to ask and to determine. So if you're in the habit of saying, oh yeah, it's because my, my dad always says that, or my brother, or, or my professor always knows, I'll just assume it's right. Ask questions. 
never get in the habit of assuming. So if you take those first three principles and then apply a habit to it, the Toltecs said a master habit is to always do your best. Put those four into action. The first book that he wrote was called The Fourth Agreement. And then Ruiz thought about it for a while. And he upgraded one rule, which is a decent way, a, a decent proposition. And that's this. Be skeptical, but learn to listen. Be skeptical, but be open. Ask questions. But in sales, what we know over and over, in 325 we talked about this, you, only, you have one of these and you have two of these for an important reason. That selling is not telling. Selling is listening. Selling is asking questions and understanding needs and thinking through how it is that you can bring in the litany of products and services that you have to offer that can satisfy someone's need. So be skeptical. Smile. You don't have to, as high D's do it, you don't have to say, you're wrong. You can say, hmm, I'm confused about this. Could you help me understand that? Which is a much easier, it gets, a, it gets to the same point, but doesn't do this. Doesn't say, you're wrong. You can't, can't be right. Skeptical, learn to listen. Now, any questions before we start the syllabus? Set number four in five, be skeptical. This one. I got to three, never answer. I've got impeccable, don't take anything personally, don't assume, always do your best, be skeptical. Now, our textbook. I bought 14 copies of this. I have three in my office. I think we have 16 or 17 people. I never buy all of them because someone says, oh, I'll just get my own. So I'll bring these in on Wednesday. Hopefully they'll be here by Wednesday. And they're 15 bucks. I bought them for 13, 13.80 plus postage. So you're buying for me. 15 bucks. This is, this book was written in 1939 by, by Napoleon Hill. And each one of you should know the history. And some of my students have heard this story over and over again, but it's a good one. Napoleon Hill had an interview with Andrew Carnegie. Andrew Carnegie? Andrew Carnegie? You know him? Well, actually, yes. The Carnegie Hall got their money from Andrew Carnegie. He was the, the fellow who figured out in the 1800s that you could radically reduce the price of uh, of steel per ton if you consolidated all the thousands of steel factories. Not the factories there are steel mills. mills. Yeah. You, if you consolidated those and you, you put together those economies of scale, you could reduce the price. You reduced the price by 90%. So a yeah, dollar to a dime. And that created the Industrial Revolution because steel was dirt cheap. And Carnegie became the wealthiest man in the world. So Carnegie was in his in his 80s, and Napoleon Hill was in his 20s. It was about 1910 he had this interview. So he got an interview with Andrew Carnegie, and he wanted to learn how it is he'd been so successful. So in that short meeting, Carnegie, as the legend says, took a liking to him. And he stopped him, and he said, Mr. Hill, he said, I want to make you a proposition. He said, I know you want me to talk to you about why I've been successful, but the issue is a lot bigger. He said, it's not only have I been successful, but hundreds of other people have been eminently successful. And he said, it would be much better for you, not only to interview me, but to interview all of them. And he said, if you'll spend the next 25 years of your life studying why it is that some people have been so successful, and then publishing that, I will write a letter of introduction now that will get you in front of anyone in the United States. And ostensibly, the legend says, 
he's, he couldn't stop watching. The Point Hill had a minute. The Point Hill said, yep, I'll do it. So literally, he interviewed Thomas Edison, Firestone, Woolworth, you, I mean, uh, Teddy Roosevelt, you name all the important people he interviewed. And he wrote this mammoth book called The Law of Success, which is still in print. The, sum, the, the summation of that book is called Think and Grow Rich. And those books he didn't make much money on in the 30s until he wrote this book, which is the application of Think and Grow Rich to sales. And then he took it on the road, did seminars all the way across the United States. And then he hit the big time. So this book was just republished a year ago, back in print. This is our textbook. And what you're going to do with this textbook, I'm making the assumption in this class that you're going on to a career in sales or that you're going to use sales some, somewhere in your career. You don't have to become a professional salesperson, but I'm preparing you to do that in this class. And this book will prepare you here. The reason I use it is that early on in my first couple courses, I used a textbook, a Spin Selling, that was a was an, it was a, a much better understanding of how to how to succeed in the in the investigative stage of selling or how to ask great great questions it's a great book but two of my students went to work for Tom James and the biggest problem they had was not asking investigative questions the biggest problem they had was here they didn't handle their emotions didn't handle this chaotic, horrible, you, you, don't, you don't get it yet. You don't understand the work world yet. Maybe some of you who are working almost full time get it. But when you go into professional sales, the world is chaotic. And it's what it appears. So the purpose for this book is to help you understand how to harness this, this for yourself. You can do that. Then you can take on the rest of the world. But if you can't handle this guy, then a whole myriad of problems comes up. And that is, everything else is the problem. Oh, I'm just fine, but this guy did this, and she did that, and he told me that. All those things will defeat you in your sales career, unless you're willing to step up and say, no, it's up to me. This is it. This worked extraordinarily well last semester. It means you're going to read it, and it in teams, your teams are going to teach this to each other. Session by session by session. <laughs> we tried last semester. Worked great. Session, you have a question? No. If, you know, now you know, in this class, if you have a question, you just raise your hand. We're, we're truth seekers. So if I say something you don't agree with, with he, you can raise your hand, even though you're not likely to. You can raise your hand. And you can say, <laughs> I... How does a, an IS this later, ask a question when he or she disagrees? You know how to do that? Because you wouldn't say, I disagree. Um, you would say that you agree, but you're yeah, but you confused. Don't. But you don't. Oh, I'm confused is good. You also might say, I have a different way of thinking about that. Isn't that easy, Mr. Carter? You can say that. But you have to get across that you disagree in a way that enables you to do it. Questions about the book? I ordered mine on Amazon. So did I. Okay. But I don't think it looks like that. It had a picture of it. Oh, that's okay. It's the same book. Okay. Same book. Now let's talk about uh, 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 so most of you are seniors, so this class is very informal. The purpose of this class is to really get you home, get your presentation skills home. But there are certain things in here that I'm going to expect of you because you need to begin operating as if you're out of college, 
and you're responding in the real world. You leave this guy behind. One of them is going to be non-words. Some of you have already solved this. I mean, Mr. Rush hasn't quite solved this, but maybe he has. And Ms. Heschner. These are our clickers. And we'll have, as you do your presentations, one team will retain clickers. And if one of those non-words, uh, um, like, right. So, and people invent their own. When a non-word comes up, we'll, let me step back a second. I'm making a big, <laughs> Let me first ask, how many of you have decided to spend the rest of your career at Western? Anybody? Okay. If you haven't, that means that when you graduate, you're going to get the you know what out of here, right? Mm -hmm. You're leaving. And you're going to go out in the real world. So when someone in the real world hears one of those non words in your communications, uh, um, like, and you're casting an image, you're projecting an image. What, how do they view that image when they hear those words? Mr. Rush. What do they think about you? That you don't know what you don't know what you're trying to say at the moment. So right. you know. That's part. It's worse. What else? Uh, you know, uh, like, you know. I try to say something. <coughs> So what, what, what do they, how do they perceive your image? What do they think about it? Maybe unprofessional. Unprofessional, yes, that's good. It gets worse. This boom? Probably think you're immature. Immature? Could get worse. <laughs> Mr. Miller? talking about? Incompetent. Incompetent. Uneducated. Uneducated. Or you're still in college. <laughs> okay. You know what? Anyone want to sound like they're still in college? Okay. So let me just make sure. And is it okay? It, it can, will you give nagging rights to every one of your classmates to click you when they hear a non-word in your presentation? Okay? No assumptions. All right. That's what I thought. Just had to make sure. I don't think we're going to need these today, but I'll reserve <laughs> So the purpose of our course, once again, <laughs> is to make sure that when you leave the course, you feel confident and able to step up with a minimum of preparation and deliver presentation to almost anyone, anywhere. And of course, the more time you have to prepare, even and the better. You're also going to get an opportunity in this course, if you're making a presentation in another course, to apply what you've learned here and in one of the projects to actually create the presentation for another course. On the first page, I say this. The vast majority of classroom activity will revolve, will revolve around you, not me. I'm going to be actively involved in the first couple sessions. But after that, it's going to be you. And when you deliver your presentations, one team is going to evaluate. And I'm going to expect that other team to, to, to assess presentations one of two ways. That is, what went well, what needs improvement. We're never going to say, that was bad. Oh, she was horrible. No, it's always what went well and what can improve. Because I want to get into your habit pattern, the notion that my next presentation is going to be the best, one ever the best one you've ever given. So, yeah, you can screw it up. You can maybe not practice as much, but then get into the habit of saying, I'm not doing that again. I'm, my next one is going to be the best one I've ever delivered. My sense is that if you bear down, that this class has the potential to put you in advance in the interviewing process 
in advance in the recruiting process. My students tell me this all the time, that they had a conversation with a recruiter and the recruiter was amazed because their communication was clear. And what they, the recruiter doesn't understand is that you're applying benefits to them and asking them good questions. They're blown away. At the last career fair, laughed like the big ones. I was with a recruiter and a young lady came by and she said, hello, what can you do for me? I thought, oh my God. And I watched the recruiter. Oh, and she, she'd had that question a zillion times, so she just went on, this is what we do. But the person that comes in and says, wow, I'm really excited with your company. Can I ask you a couple questions about it? She said, yeah, what do you want to know? That's where you want to be. Now, I expect you to attend every class. And how many are graduating in May? Oh, we're going to get senioritis somewhere in time in April or May. Okay. And what that means is that you will be here, if there's a tendency for you to be here when you're presenting and then not be here when you're not. Let me suggest to you. That the, and you know this, that the real learning that goes on is when you're evaluating others and you see them and you say, oh, that was really good. Or, oh, I wonder why she did that. So the more times you're here, the more times you're grading and evaluating presentations, the more you're growing your own ability. So please don't fall into that trap of thinking that somehow there's nothing here to learn if you're not presenting. If you, once I've assigned teams, and you'll know exactly when you're presenting, if there is a date in which you cannot make your presentation, you have to switch with someone else. You have to do it voluntarily and do it 48 hours in advance and tell me. If you say, oh, I'm sorry, I have to, no, sorry. If you're not here to make your presentation, you get a zero on that presentation. Is that clear? Okay, Mr. Martin? So what grade do you get if you're not here? You get a zero if you're not here to make your presentation. Now when you, when you make your presentation, I'm going to expect you to look the part. Look the part. You always dress up one level above the expectation of your audience. So look the part. Act the part. If you have something that you and you tell and you tell me this in advance that you have to leave early on a particular day, that's okay. You just have to tell me in advance. But if you're presenting that day, make sure that you get in line to present so that that doesn't so you can still meet your other activity. But you have to do that in advance. There is some written work here. Each semester, I have reduced the written work. But still, the written work that you'll do, I expect you to do it professionally as if you were in this job. That means spelling and punctuation. Do your best. When you deliver your presentation on how to sell your way through life, you're going to get four minutes a piece to deliver your presentations. And this worked really well last semester. We're going to have one or two teams, one designated, maybe, maybe some other people to, to provide feedback. But if four people are presenting, you are going to grade them this way. The one that was the best of the four gets a 10. The next best is a 9, the next best is an 8, the next best is a 7. Doesn't mean I'll grade them that way, but I just want to, to force you to tell me best to least best. That's an input to me as I make final grades. On page 2, and I didn't number the pages, 
Once we're through with how to sell your way through life, we're on, we're on page two now. Assignment one. Once we're through with that, by Friday, April 6th, you're going to give me a one-page smart action plan. Mr. Marley, what's a smart action plan? Smart stands for a smart goal. Remember that? Hmm. Let's see. Mr. Dow, smart action plan. Smart stands for? Specific, measurable, accurate, realistic, and timely. Achievable, Achieve. realistic, time bound. What's this mean? It means every time you set a goal, you go through the smart process. Is it specific? Is the goal measurable? Is it achievable? Is it realistic? Is it time bounded? When you set a goal and you can and you answer every one of those attributes, then you know you have a real goal. So I want a smart action plan from each one of you on what you decide you're going to do as a consequence of having read How to Sell Your Way Through Life. That's due by April 6th. It's in bold. If I receive your plan late, no points. Assignment two. You're going to construct and we'll go over snib and, and spin in one of the first sessions. I think we're going to do that. Next, we're going to do that on Wednesday. Okay. And So you're going to do a singleton style presentation, which I'll go over next uh, on Wednesday. You can either deliver this, you can either construct this for a presentation you're actually going to deliver, or one that you would like to deliver to your mom, to your best friend. You're going to deliver some presentation for something that you want, and you're going to use a snib argument to make that case. First. We're going to do a mock presentation, and the mock presentation is the basic argument. Is the argument logical? Then you're going to do your the real SNP presentation, which is six minutes, and that will go from on your schedule on the next to last page. You can see, uh, as a matter of fact. Probably it would be easier to explain this if I just went to the schedule. Yeah, let's do that. Turn to the next to last page. On the left hand side, you've got the schedule for selling. So the first half of the course of every session, we're going to, from 325 until 4 o'clock, you are going to present how to sell your way through life. At about 4 o'clock, we switch and we go over to our presentations from 4 o'clock till 4.45. It will take us until March 28th to completely read the book. And then when that, when that finishes, we'll begin our one-on-one -on -one presentations in our presentation room. On the right-hand side, you'll see. Today, we're going to talk about the syllabus and the course, and I'm going to talk about DISC and, and motivators. Then spin and snip next week in an introduction to the book. I'm going to get you up for your first presentation on the 30th and the 1st. And this will be an easy presentation in which you'll just tell a story, something that happened to you. We'll videotape it, you'll get feedback, and you'll go watch your presentation like we've done before. You'll do your mock snibs on, uh, on the presentation you choose in the next three sessions, and then the real presentation. Six minutes. And, and you'll learn in this class, we started in 325, you'll learn that for any presentation, all you really need is six minutes. Anything over six minutes and you're going to start losing the attention of your, of your audience. So six minutes and then you ask for questions. And if you've done it correctly, the person either says, yes, I love this, or I have questions, and either of those two is is an equal option. Spring break for a couple sessions. 
then you will have, it's a class requirement here, not an option, to shadow a business to business salesperson. Let me suggest to you, you have to start this now. And that is, you've got to find a business to business salesperson. If you can't, and you throw in the towel for one letter grade less than you achieve, if you have a B, you get a C, if you get an A, you get a B, I will give you a salesperson, a B2B salesperson. The objective here is for you to prospect on your own, talk to your parents, or talk to others and say, do you know a really good salesperson? The objective is it can't be B to C. It can't be they're selling things to consumers. It's not, it's business to business we're looking for and not business to consumers. Do you have a question on that? That's a really important part of this course because this is, I want you to compare what you've learned here and in 325 to someone who's doing this for a living. And then, and then I have a series of questions I want you to ask to make sure that you're able to evaluate this in light of what you've learned because after this, if you're going into sales, you're going to start doing this real, for real. So this is one of the, the shadowing exercise, almost everyone loves this activity. How many have done a shadowing thus far? Yeah, do you agree? Yeah, it's a great experience. The shadowing experience is, this is going to be a Q&A session. The Q&A is, you're going to take a couple minutes to explain your shadowing experience as to other people, and then the rest of the class is going to ask you questions about your experience. That will be that particular presentation. On the 21st of March, Dan Moore, who is the president of the Southwestern Company. Anybody know Southwestern? Well, Southwestern is 150 years old. They started selling Bibles door to door. 150 years ago, 1860. And Tom James is actually owned by the chairman of the Southwestern Company. It's one of the sister companies. So the president of Southwestern is going to be here. He is a great speaker. So don't miss that, that session. I'm going to give him the whole time. He, he teaches his, his people how to deliver great presentations and has a really high expectation. Great guy. Then, on Monday the 2nd, we'll begin our presentations. This year, we're not presenting Omnicrux. We're presenting Culligan. Culligan is a company that's been around for 50 or 60 years. They, they make water more drinkable, usable. They filter it. They have water softening equipment. They sell drinking water. They sell it in in dispensers, they sell it by the bottle. And I've had an opportunity to get to know the franchisee for Western Kentucky. And the franchisee wants to open Bowling Green. So in my 420 class, 420. Miss Dehone? Yeah. Miss Dehone is like the only crossover in 420, right? We're going to be selling Culligan in my 420 class. Much different than last semester when we sold two products that were really hard to sell. Really hard to sell. We didn't sell them. What was it? One was Omniprize and one was Express One, Express One order warehouse and order fulfillment. You guys didn't do it? Nope. Too tough. We tried hard and almost to a person. Everyone said, wow, it was a great experience. I'm glad I heard no 60,000 times. <laughs> it was valuable for me to learn that, but I, I wish we could have sold something. That uh, was too tough to sell. Culligan, on the other hand, is a great product to start off with. So we're going to be doing B2B and B2C. B2C means people in their homes. How many of you have some water filtration system in your house? One. How many drink bottled water? See? So there is a distrust of tap water, which is not really accurate. 
I just think Bowling Green water tastes yeah, terrible. It is really bad. Oh. And so what do you do as a result of not liking the tap water? Buy bottled water. You buy bottled water. Okay, Culligan sells bottled water, they sell them in dispensers, they sell filtr filtration equipment, and that's the B2C. So, yes, Bowling Green has water that doesn't taste good, and there are lots of people who'd love to have better tasting water. So, you're going to have, each one of you is going to have a B to C presentation in that room with a real buyer. Second, businesses have business uses for, for distilled water, really clean water. And Culligan has figured out how to, to dist, not distill it, but to deionize water so that it has all the properties of distilled water. And yet it comes out of a machine. You don't have to buy distilled water at the supermarket. And then they do other things. They, in every restaurant has some kind of water softening process connected to their dishwashers. Because the water's hard and it, will, it interferes with the filter. So the Culligan people have this machine that they'll install, which you can, which you can sell, which you might sell, to dentists and other people. So I'll be presenting you with information about Culligan, and you'll be building your one-on-one -on -one sales presentation, one B to C, one B to B. Both the B2B and the B2C, you will be selling the both times? Mm -hmm. Just with the yeah. Okay. Yeah. When's the ideal date for us to have the shadow done by 12th of March? You, the syllabus says that you must submit your package on the day you have your shadowing experience, the day you come in. So that means you've got to have, if you're on team five, Sorry, if you're on team one, you've got to have your shadowing experience done and your and your paper written by the 12th. So understand, this is coming up really soon. So you've got to get started on your shadowing. The 12th. March. Yep. So this is imminent. Don't let this one slip. Other questions? No fun. Now the next page simply gives you the, the chapter, the chapter subject of every one of Napoleon Hill's chapters. Now one thing on your presentations, and then we want to talk about this a little bit, about your presentations is this. presentation. You're not just saying, in chapter 8, this subject was discussed. No, you're going to embrace chapter 8. And you're going to motivate each of you to pay special attention. Chapter 8, chapter 9, chapter 10, chapter 11. And sometimes chapters are this big. Sometimes it's just a page. It doesn't mean, well, my chapter is only a page long, so I don't have much to say about that. No! You're going to bring that to life. That means you're going to present arguments and examples out of your life, things you've done and you haven't done. Bring that to life. To the extent you bring it to life, up goes your grade. Questions? Now, let's take a couple minutes. And how many of you brought your profiles? Did I ask you to do that? All right, so we'll just make a little minor change. Bring your profiles next time. <clears throat> and now let's go over something we're going to talk about next time we'll talk about today. Let's talk about
I want to talk to you about the process that came from a book called Spin Selling by Neil Rackham. R-A-C-K-H-A-M. It's on your, is it on the list of extra credit books, Mr. Kim? It actually is not. It's not. Hmm. If you want to read this book, it's on the list. It is, I read this 25 years ago. It's the finest book I've ever read at helping you design the questions that you need to ask in the investigative stage in the selling process. The selling process. You spend 40% of your time building trust. 30% of your time identifying needs. 20% of your time presenting, 10% of your time closing. This is the professional selling model. The money to be made in professional selling is in this stage, is in identifying needs. And it's the rare salesperson that does a good job here. So after you've built trust, after you've got a bond, after you're sitting there and you're getting a smiling face, person's leaning forward, yes, you've talked about the ball games, you've connected to the college education, and so you get to this stage that says, now how do I identify needs? You have to go through the building trust segment to be able to identify needs, because if you don't, as you begin to ask penetrating, pro you know, provocative, probing questions, the person shuts up or doesn't tell you the truth. So you have to be able to ask a series of questions that reveals the extent to, w to which the person really has a need for your product or your service. This is, this is the subject of spin selling by Neil Rackham. If you're going to go into sales, who's going into sales right now? You've got to read the book. This is just absolute requirement. So, if you guys want to read the book now, and I'll, I'll give you an extra credit for it. So after the building trust segment, you then have to segue into beginning to talk about, to address what the concerns are that the person has. So you ask the first level of questions called situation questions. If you are selling Culligan water to a consumer, what would be some situation questions that you might ask? Business or? No, this is a B2C. This is a consumer. Um, where do you usually drink? Or where do you usually get the water you drink? Right. How do you like, how do you like the taste of your water? It's a situation question. Would you say you are a, that you, how much water do you use? How do you use water at home? You ask a very general question to get the person talking. What's the problem with spending too much time on situation questions? Remember Ms. Dykes? Mm -mm. If you say to a consumer, how much water do you use? And how much water does your family use? What do you use it for? What happens? Ms. Teshner? They lose uh, interest. Exactly. You get bored. So you have to be really careful with situational questions. It's, it's, what you should do is study in advance as much as you can about the person's situation, then ask a couple leading questions that yield the potential for a problem question. How does your family like the taste of water here in Bowling Green? A leading question? So, what do you mean? On a scale of 1 to 10. 1 is 
absolutely hate the water, would never drink it out of the tap. And then says, I like to kind of get my mouth down and just suck in as much as I, I like. Where are you? That's a situation question. But so now you've got to identify that there's some problem. The so problem question might be, you see? Now, what happens when you ask closed-ended questions? Closed -ended yes or no, right? What you want to do is start your questions with How a verb. How, if, why. How do you think the water and fall under your mm, might say, How do you think hmm, the water How could they improve the water? I'm not sure I could answer that. The two questions you always start off with. How do you like the water comes out of the tap? There's one thing about that water you can improve. What would it be? It's usually the question that leads you to problem question. You say, well, I like it. There's nothing wrong with the water. We just replaced our, our water here. Yeah, but it was pretty old. It was three years old. Oh? Three years old. Hmm. I'm going to start to probe there because water heaters ought to last at least seven years. Ours is ten years. My wife's been after me for three years to drain it. I still haven't drained it. It's still doing <coughs> fine. So I have a problem question. So the problem is, tell me about let me understand what concerns you have, and then let me begin to ask you questions about that. So remember what we do. This is, the problem question is like pushing on someone's shoulder, right? Problem, ouch, ouch, ouch. That's what you do. You gotta be careful, you can only ask a couple problem questions. Once you uncover that they just replaced their water heater, why? Well, they said something about about hard water. 